What's going on guys? Dare here with Fantasy Football Advice coming at you with another Fantasy Football video. Today, it's Saturday. You know what time it is. We are going over the top 15 quarterbacks and tight ends in our rankings. As we do that in batches of 5, we will gloss over players we think have a bit more risk than meets the eye or possibly are being undervalued or underranked in this matchup. With the Fantasy Playoffs starting just next week, making the correct start and sit decision is as important as ever. If you guys are unsure which tight end or quarterback that you should be starting you can access our full rankings at our website thefantasyfootballadvice.com members of our website not only gain access to the rankings you'll get all of our waiver information sports betting picks dfs picks and more so if that's something that interests you once again that's at our website thefantasyfootballadvice.com link as always in the description box below with that being said though let's hop over to the stat of the day yesterday's stat of the day was which wide receiver currently has the lowest average average target distance the correct answer was actually Debo Samuel congratulations coach Dan you got this one right as for today's stat of the day which quarterback currently has the lowest completion rate while under pressure once again that's which quarterback has the worst completion rate while under pressure if you know who that player is leave your answer in the comment section down below we'll be happy to let you know who wins in tomorrow's video all right guys without further ado let's hop right into the top five tight ends no names here should be too surprising. Of course, there is a bit of a difference in tier here with the top five tight ends. You have Travis Kelsey, of course, and Darren Waller. Usually, Mark Andrews would be around this top five ranking. He is not going to play this week due to COVID. Outside of those three players, I do believe there is a skill gap when it comes to ceiling. The floor for a player like Mark Andrews isn't all that high, so you could argue that. But what I am trying to say is that there is one player this week that does bring in that top tier upside. Shouldn't be as too much of a surprise since he's been highlighted in green on your screen and that's TJ Hawkinson of the Detroit Lions that may come as a little bit of a surprise to some of you I know the matchup against Chicago it always does seem a bit scary it's understandable I mean the team is ranked top 10 at mitigating fantasy points to the running back position top 6 at mitigating fantasy points to quarterbacks and is even a top 3 defense at defending opposing fantasy wide receivers virtually every area of this defense is really strong and not a matchup that we ideally want to start our players against but that goes completely in reverse when we're talking about tight ends the Chicago Bears have been really giving it up to the tight end position both in volume as well as touchdowns when it comes to that volume they've allowed between five to eight receptions in every game since week seven so yes they've been playing consistently bad allowing that amount of volume when it also comes to the touchdowns they've allowed at least one receiving touchdown to a tight end in four of the last five games including last Last game in which they allowed a multi TD game and as long as those trends do hold true the floor in the ceiling for TJ Hawkinson will be pretty high as a player himself TJ Hawkinson has been producing as a top five tight end for virtually the entire season he's been one of the few tight ends that hasn't needed an immense amount of volume to secure his spot as a top five tight end Kenny Galladay as we know he has already been ruled out the remainder of the wide receiving core it's not as banged up as it has been in the past few weeks and no receiver does carry any injury designation but like I said the Chicago Bears are very strong at defending opposing wide receivers so even a healthy wide receiving core should not limit the production and volume going to TJ Hawkinson because there's no guarantee they will have that amount of success when targeting wide receivers throughout this matchup when it comes to the other four tight ends we have ranked in the top five this week I don't have any major concerns so we'll just move over to the tight ends six through ten. Six through ten consists of players like Dallas Goddard, Noah Fant, Mike Gesicki, Hayden Harrison, Eric Ebron, very matchup based type starters, definitely players who have produced throughout the season, but also players who have each went through lulls. This makes them very difficult to trust week over week, and you'll notice I have Dallas Goddard highlighted in yellow here, and I know this is a start and sit video where we should be really defined on which players that we feel strongly should have a good game or which players that we feel bring in an excessive amount of risk, but when it comes to Dallas Goddard, he does bring in the risk, but there is a level of security with him. My goal in highlighting him is to just outline some of the extra variables that are going to take place with Dallas Goddard this week 
don't get it mistaken, we still do have him ranked inside the top 10, but with the way that Carson Wentz has been playing, you know there is already a certain level of risk that you're assuming when starting a player on the Eagles. The first variable in the elephant in the room definitely has to be Zach Ertz returning from injury. How involved Zach Ertz will be in his first game back, that remains to be determined, but it's likely a factor that is going to influence the amount of volume that's going to go to Dallas Goddard. Dallas Goddard already since returning hasn't been a player who's been on the high end of receiving volume. While yes, he is coming off of a 10 target game, in his three games prior, since returning from injury, he has had a combined 13 targets. His high prior to that game was six targets since returning. And while yes, he did score a touchdown in each game, the Green Bay Packers, they are very stingy at defending opposing tight ends. Only two games this season have the Green Bay Packers even allowed a receiving touchdown to a tight end. So to think that the Philadelphia Eagles, who have been extremely struggling offensively, are going to just come in here with an additional weapon of Zach Ertz, and all of a sudden Dallas Goddard is going to feast against this defense that has been playing pretty well against that position all season long. It's a silly bet to take. This game also has a 47 point projected total. The money line also projects the Packers to win by nearly double digit points. So offensively, we're also not expecting the Eagles to have a very phenomenal game. So the total amount of touchdowns that are projected to go around, they're going to be much lower. The competition for targets in this offense is going to be much higher. And the defense is a top five defense at mitigating fantasy points to opposing tight ends. All of that does bring in factors that add to the risk and lower the floor of that of Dallas Goddard. He has been playing well, catching a touchdown in each of the last two games. But I want to set your expectations to not be all that disappointed if Dallas Goddard doesn't pop off this week. Switching it up a bit, let's move over to a tight end that I really like the matchup and the potential for them this week. That's Mike Gesicki of the Miami Dolphins. My liking of Gesicki this week and my projection for him is all related to Ryan Fitzpatrick starting this week. If Tua does start, I don't think his floor or his ceiling is going to be as high. So if you are a Gesicki owner, that's just something you should be keeping in mind. I'm not saying he's completely unstartable with Tua starting. This is, of course, a defense that you can feast against as a tight end, which is exactly one of the reasons I like him this week. The Cincinnati Bengals have allowed six or more receptions to a tight end in over 50% of their games. They're also one of the few defenses that have allowed a multi-TD game to a tight end on multiple occasions. This defense's willingness to allow a high amount of receptions, it does boost the floor of a player like Mike Gesicki. That potential of a multi-TD performance does also raise the ceiling of Mike Gesicki, so I'm really liking the combo this week. Don't get me wrong though, I'm not saying that this is a 100% given. The point total in this game it is very low one of the lowest of the week at a mere 42 points and the Miami Dolphins are nearly 11 and a half point favorites in this matchup but the running back crew for Miami there are a lot of questions on who's to get the volume and what level of success that they will have on the ground so that could open the door even in a game where Miami has a massive lead that they still rely on the passing game to move the ball downfield in the late quarters moving over to a player I'm a little less thrilled about is going to be Hayden Hurst of the Atlanta Falcons and when it comes to Hurst, we know that he really struggled in their last matchup against New Orleans. That was a mere two weeks ago in which he had two targets, was able to convert none of them, and posted zeros across the board. In his defense, the Atlanta Falcons will be heading into this matchup a bit more banged up in the receiving core, so the overall opportunities for Hayden Hurst should increase. That means more snaps, more potential targets, which should result in production, but my concern with him this week doesn't stem from the lack of volume he received the last time these two teams face. I'm more concerned with exactly how good the New Orleans Saints have been at defending the tight end position. They've had basically a tale of two seasons through the first five games. They ranked dead last at mitigating fantasy points to tight ends, but over the final six, they have been complete fire at defending that position. The level of talent has dropped off from the players that they faced, but at the same time, we still have to respect these numbers. In four of the past six games, they have allowed one or fewer receptions to a tight end, making the floor for tight ends facing them virtually non-existent. Throughout that six game span, they have allowed a combined 124 receiving yards to tight ends, an average of under 21 yards per game, and if we remove the largest performance throughout that six game sample, it looks much, much worse. In that five game sample, only one team has been able to eclipse one reception, and the high in receiving yards in any game through that span has been 15 receiving yards. When I'm looking at a player like Hayden Hurst this week, who has been a little hot and cold on the season, and I see such a terrible matchup, even the depleted weapons isn't enough 
enough for me to get completely off my guard on this one. The projected total in this game is a mere 46 points. Taysom Hill being a more mobile quarterback does open up the door for time of possession to be a bit more in the favor of New Orleans Saints who are heading into this game as a three point road favorite. Let's move over to the final five tight ends. We have the tight ends 11 through 15. No need to go super in depth with these players. These are going to be your back end TE1s or your streaming options. I do genuinely like all of these receivers. None of them I'm really disliking, but there is one who I would consider a sleeper that not many people are paying attention to. That of course is going to be Jordan Akins highlighted in green. This is a situation that I see similarly to TJ Hawkinson where he's facing a scary defense, but the matchup for his position isn't as fearful as meets the eye. The Indianapolis Colts at defending tight ends have been trending down over the past five weeks. In three of five of those games, they allowed seven plus receptions to a tight end. As we know, Jordan Akins is probably stepping into a major role in this offense with Will Fuller now suspended six games, virtually a season ending suspension for him. And there have been multiple occasions throughout this season that we have seen Deshaun Watson rely on the tight end position. Those games have typically come in the more difficult defensive matchups. Think New England, think Baltimore. So in this game, the first time that the Indianapolis Colts are playing the Houston Texans, a team that is hurting for weapons to move the ball downfield, Jordan Akins is going to be put in a prime position to succeed. With that being said, let's move over to our quarterbacks. And on the screen now, you'll notice the top five. How fitting that we ended the tight ends with Jordan Akins because we are transitioning over to the top five quarterbacks. And as you'll notice, we have Deshaun Watson highlighted in red. When it comes to Deshaun Watson, he's been on an absolute tear. In fact, two of his best performances came in the past two weeks. But losing a top tier receiver, a top 10 fantasy receiver like Will Fuller, it is going to have an impact on how successful this offense will be at moving the ball downfield. We can't forget that they are lacking receivers outside of Will Fuller already. This basically leaves Brandon Cooks and Kiki Kuti to pick up most of the work from the wide receiver position. And coming into this matchup against Indianapolis, they really couldn't have picked a worse defense to be under man playing against this week. There have only been three games this season where Indianapolis has allowed a 20 plus fantasy point game to a quarterback. Even Tannehill, who may be a bit more matchup based, has only been able to average in their two contests against Indianapolis sub 15 fantasy points per game. Neither one of those games did he go over 20 fantasy points. So the floor for Deshaun Watson, a player who we've seen perform a bit up and down on the season, who is now lacking weapons, it just brings in additional risk for a top five player. Now, obviously, I'm not sitting here and telling you to bench him. It's unlikely unless you own a player like Herbert that you're going to find a comparable player to swap him out with. Somebody with a bit less risk, just be sure to set your expectations appropriately. Indianapolis, they are very strong, and Deshaun Watson will be coming in under man. We are moving over to the quarterback 6 through 10. This tier consists of Justin Herbert, Kyler Murray, Ryan Tannehill, Taysom Hill, and Lamar Jackson. You'll notice mostly here that we have three studs who have fallen a bit in the ranks just due to matchup. Spoiler alert, I don't have any major concerns with any of those three players, that being Justin Herbert, Kyler Murray, or Lamar Jackson. But the player I did want to highlight is Ryan Tannehill, who you will see in green up above. One thing I want to let you guys know about right off the bat is that there are so many talented quarterbacks in the player pool that a quarterback's ranking can go from top six to just inside the top 20 depending on the matchup. Ryan Tannehill you'll notice we didn't have ranked high at all last week but that was because he was facing the Indianapolis Colts. In this week's matchup we have a completely different situation with Tennessee playing against the Cleveland Browns. It is worth noting that from a fantasy perspective Ryan Tannehill had been playing much better at the first half of the season. He's realistically only eclipsed 20 plus fantasy points once since we Week six, but I feel very strongly that this will be the week he breaks that trend. While Ryan Tannehill will be coming into this game without Jonu Smith, who has already been ruled out, we saw in the absence of Jonu Smith, Anthony Ferkser, he stepped up and produced, so we shouldn't see a massive drop off, at least not from the tight end position. The Tennessee Titans offense has also been going through the wide receivers as of late. We really love Corey Davis as well as AJ Brown this week, and you can't love both of those players without loving Ryan Tannehill as well. When it comes to the Cleveland Browns 
defensively. They're strongest at defending the run. Not saying that's going to stop Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry will be one of the primary chain movers for this offense, of course. But ranking last when it comes to defending tight ends and bottom 10 when it comes to defending opposing receivers, it's going to open up plenty of opportunities for Ryan Tannehill in this matchup. As for Ryan Tannehill facing Cleveland, there's only been one game this season in which the Cleveland Browns have held off a team from completing a passing touchdown and have even had four games this season in which they have allowed three plus passing touchdowns to a fantasy quarterback. That's a ratio of over one third of their games. So heading into this one, I really like the odds of Ryan Tannehill posting a bounce back performance. We're moving into the next quarterback and unfortunately it is going to be Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan in the last game that they played against the New Orleans Saints that was on the road of course he only posted a mere 5.28 fantasy points his completion percentage 51.4 percent and he was unable to eclipse 250 passing yards believe it or not he has not eclipsed 300 passing yards since week 7 in 6 of his 11 games so far this season he has posted one or fewer passing touchdowns so so far on the year he has been more hurtful to your team than he has actually been a producer or benefiting your team heading into this matchup he will be playing at home but coming into this one we also have major questions as to the health of the wide receivers there has been a little joke that we shouldn't start Matt Ryan in games where Julio isn't readily available or playing or limited while Julio Jones has not yet been ruled out and I'm not saying that he will be ruled out there is the potential out there for him to be limited and we may not have that information prevy to us before starting him in our lineups taking a look at Matt Ryan as an individual contributor he's only had two games where he has eclipsed 20 plus fantasy points since week two and seven of his past nine games he's been unable to eclipse 18 including five of those nine games where he's been under 14 and even two of those games has he been under seven fantasy points if your quarterback is giving you seven fantasy points you're unlikely to win this week's matchup and with quarterbacks they don't give you anything from their legs no aspect of the run game adding additional fantasy points to them the floor for those players it is going to be much lower we saw that floor just two weeks ago the last time these two teams faced which was actually Matt Ryan's worst fantasy performance on the season, which is really saying something because I just explained exactly how bad he's been at times. We're moving over to the final five quarterbacks. This is going to be the QBs 11 through 15. To start, we have Kirk Cousins, who I definitely undervalued last week. The big news last week, of course, was that Adam Thielen was on the reserve COVID list, unable to play, and that was a big hit. Adam Thielen's been a wide receiver one for this offense throughout the entire season, playing much more consistently than a player like Justin Jefferson. Adam Thielen also heading into that matchup was the league leader in end zone targets. When they get to that area of the field, they usually look for Adam Thielen first. With that option not available to them, there was the potential out there that Cousins could struggle. With Carolina being a pretty solid defense at defending opposing wide receivers, Justin Jefferson, who was going to be in a prime position to succeed, was still going to get additional defensive attention to him, also adding in risk to the matchup. Well, Kirk Cousins proved all of us wrong, just Justin Jefferson completely balled out and with all the odds stacked against him Kirk Cousins actually produced the best fantasy performance of his entire 2020 season him producing last week though isn't the only reason I like Cousins the main factor in liking Kirk Cousins this week definitely comes down to the volume as we all know Minnesota is a run first team or has been a run first team we have not seen that trend hold true though over the past three games Kirk Cousins has averaged a whopping 37 attempts per game completing 70 percent of his passes and looking darn good in the process now this week he has Adam Thielen back this is a matchup against the Jacksonville Jaguars who allow the third most fantasy points to the quarterback position on the season and have also allowed a multi TD passing performance in each of the past five weeks that alone would be enough to like Cousins this week but we also have the questions with the health of Dalvin Cook if Dalvin Cook is limited or losing touches which could impact the overall volume in the passing game that just increases the overall overall ceiling for Kirk Cousins as well. We're moving into the final player. We do have him ranked just outside the top 12. This is the QB 13 and it is Ben Roethlisberger of the Pittsburgh Steelers. This one is really simple. It's a matchup against the Washington football team. Washington has been stingy across the board at defending every position which is really going to lower the floor of a player like Ben Roethlisberger.
Roethlisberger this week. Ben Roethlisberger, as we know, a player who relies only on his arm to get his fantasy production. And with those players, the floor week to week is lower than that of mobile quarterbacks. This team will also be without James Conner in this contest, leaving Benny Snell or Anthony McFarlane to make up most of that production. How successful they will be is up in the air. We've seen each one of those players struggle immensely. If they do struggle, it could hurt Ben Roethlisberger's ability to move the ball down the field. In this team, being heavy 10 plus point favorites, their willingness to take risks, take shots deep downfield, those big plays that get Ben Roethlisberger the majority of his fantasy points, they may not be as necessary as they would be in other matchups. But guys, that's going to do it for this video. We really hoped you enjoyed. If you did, how about hitting that like button? If you're new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. We thank you all for watching and we'll catch you on the next one.